Hey everybody, it's Jay. Welcome back to my channel, where we discuss the popular culture of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I wanted to take a look back today at another animation which I watched back in the 1980s. It was based off of a novel written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Today, guys, we're going to be looking at The Hobbit. The greatest adventure is there if you're bold. Let go of the mold that life makes you hold. So I'm sure by now that many of you have already seen the Peter Jackson version of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. But back in the 1980s, we were exposed to not only the books, which were classics, but also to a production by a small animation studio called Rankin and Bass. They produced The Hobbit as a made-for-TV animation back in 1977. Now, I was way too young in 1977 to watch The Hobbit. But around the 1980s, it was rerun many times on stations like Global TV, CTV, and some American stations which we got here in Canada. I remember The Hobbit very fondly. The opening narration by the wizard Gandalf was well done, as we see the actual book which Bilbo has written there and back again, and Gandalf begins to narrate the tale as is written by Bilbo. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. As the story progresses, we meet Bilbo himself, then Gandalf, and then the 13 dwarves. Thorin Oakenshield is the leader of this company, and he is the one who tries to convince Bilbo to come along with them on their quest. Bilbo is quite perplexed, as everyone seems to be referring to him as a burglar. What is this burglar business? If you prefer, you can say expert treasure hunter. Well, yes, I do prefer that. But the allure of leaving his little hobbit hole to find out what else is out there in the wide, wide world finally gets to him, and he decides to go along with these dwarves on their merry adventure. I'm pretty sure many of you already know the story of The Hobbit, but this particular version is based on the original version of The Hobbit. And this is quite interesting, as there are many things which have changed over the years that J.R.R. Tolkien only intended for this to be a children's story. And when you watch the version of Rankin and Bass, you can really understand that this really is a made-for-television movie for children. As Bilbo goes on his adventures, he encounters trolls, spiders, elves, goblins. I remember the first time I watched the episode, I saw the trolls, and they were kind of big, hulking, almost rock-like looking um, human beings. But the real scary portions where are that of the goblins. They seemed demonic. Gigantic blobs with little stubby arms and sharp claws. They had horns on their heads and they looked like vicious, vicious dogs. They could open their mouths so wide that they could probably bite your head off. As a matter of fact, Thorin is eventually accused of being a murderer and the Goblin King attempts to bite his head off. This sword is named Orchrist, the Goblin Cleaver. <laughs> Murderers! Elf friends! These were some very frightening moments, but that was all part of the action. Later, when Bilbo encounters Gollum, it's a different type of fear. It's more suspenseful than anything else, as Gollum's character design are more frightening, yes, but more morose, kind of disgusting in the way he appears. But the way he speaks is more sinister than anything else. If Precious asks and it doesn't answer, we 
Eats it, my precious. Oh, I say. Me eaten by some sort of strange creature is something I think all of us have primal fear of. But, as we already know, Bilbo is able to outwit Gollum by playing a series of riddles with him. And this brings up another great aspect of the Rankin and Bass version of the story. A lot of the things which are portrayed are portrayed through song. Oh, bother! Many of the songs and poems which were written for the book were originally written by J.R.R. Tolkien himself. And this is wonderful, as the Rankin and Bass version has directly adapted and arranged these original songs for their version of The Hobbit. plays an integral part in The Hobbit, and as we can tell in this scene, it helps to describe that Thorin has reached Lake Town. And finally, enters the lonely mountain where he encounters the dragon, Smog. Bilbo's adventures with Smog are the climax of the entire episode. Here, we have a battle of wits between a very, very old dragon and a tiny little hobbit. The way Bilbo interacts with Smog is very interesting. He taunts him because he realizes that he can't be seen, but at the same time, he has to be very, very careful with Smog, as Smog is very intelligent. Bilbo's game of wits finally comes to a climax when Smog finally declares that he's fed up of all these riddles. But Bilbo says something very unusual, which always catches me off guard. Bilbo declares that the reason he's come is for revenge. that your success has made you some bitter enemies. This is pretty brazen for a little hobbit. And he continues to tell Smog that he has made many enemies over the years. This not only amuses Smog, but enrages him at the same time. So he decides to cook Bilbo. The other thing that always made no sense to me is why Bilbo would actually reveal himself at the end of their conversation thus giving Smog a chance to truly cook him. Bilbo narrowly escapes, but has angered Smog to the point where he wishes to take revenge out on the people who he believes are responsible for the theft of his treasure. And he takes it out on Blake Town. One of the more unique aspects of this version of The Hobbit are talking animals. The King of Eagles, for example, speaks to Gandalf, and everyone can understand him. Smog obviously speaks. Trolls speak as well. Spiders also speak. They'll make fine eating <laughs> when they come Which is one of the few things which Peter Jackson's version did retain. But the thrush also has the ability to speak. 
Yes, the same thrush which helps Bilbo to discover the secret door. As a matter of fact, the thrush is the one who actually tells Bard, the gatekeeper, of Smog's weakness. Away, you fool bird! Away! You speak? Eh? Yes. I look. So, you speak the truth, old thrush. Because Bilbo was relaying the message through the thrush to Bard in order to try and save Lake Town. Unfortunately, Lake Town is ruined, and Bard eventually becomes king. Bard's bravery is exactly why his people chose him as king. And he goes up to the Lonely Mountain to meet with Thorin to negotiate a settlement for the destruction of Lake Town. And as we already know, Thorin refuses. And this begins the War of the Five Armies. This is another point of contention for me. Because, as this is the original version of The Hobbit, it really did not give any endearing qualities to any of the dwarves. From the beginning of the film to the end of the film, they are portrayed as greedy and selfish individuals, with no redeeming qualities. Now, now then, <laughs> much to be done. We must, we must catalog our wealth. Oh, 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 dear me, and pack it for shipment. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when the dwarves seem to be pushed back and have their backs to the wall, that seems to be the only time they are willing to accept help or even ask for help. Oh, great elf king, my truest friend and ally, we must join our forces against this common scourge. O oh, noble king under the mountain, your people are like brothers unto mine. And my men and all their weapons are as one with yours. Didn't really endear me to the dwarves when I was a child. I remember thinking to myself, these dwarves are terrible. They're selfish, they're rude, they're arrogant, and they would always thrush Bilbo into the most dangerous situations without even trying to help him. I really do appreciate Peter Jackson's version of the film much more. And in doing such, I believe that J.R.R. Tolkien also recognized that he did not originally write the dwarves with any sort of redeeming qualities. So I'm certain that in later editions of The Hobbit, he rewrote it to actually have them more empathetic. Child of the kindly West, I have come to know if more of us valued your ways, food and cheer above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. The character designs and animation were performed by a small group of Japanese animators, who, some of which, would later become part of Studio Ghibli. The cast of The Hobbit were some of the most well-known voice actors in the industry at the time, including Orson Bean as Bilbo, Richard Boone as Smog, Hans Conried as Thorin Oakenshield, John Hewson as Gandalf the Grey, Brother Theodore, also known simply as Theodore, as Gollum. Many of the songs were sung by Glenn Yarborough, who was a very popular folk singer at the time. His minstrel-like voice was really fitting for The Hobbit itself, and he actually does reappear in the next edition of the Rankin and Bass series of J.R.L. Tolkien stories. The greatest adventure is what lies ahead Today and tomorrow are yet to be said These songs and their lyrics were adapted for the television version by Jules Bass himself. The animation was also produced here in America by Reckon and Bass Productions, who is one of my favorite animation studios. I plan to do a lot more episodes on Reckon and Bass, 
as well as a history. So I really hope you'll enjoy that. The Hobbit has been criticized by many in the YouTube community, and I think it's not really given its fair shake. The animation itself, although somewhat simple in its design, was really well animated if you take a look at it again. The character designs were extremely unique and had a whimsical, fantastic flair, very worthy of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Although it wasn't well shaded or as special effects heavy as many other productions later down the road, The Hobbit's simplistic nature and wonderful storytelling, mostly based off of the idea that it was created by J.R.R. Tolkien, really helped for many of us who were watching the cartoon to really appreciate this complex story of a small hobbit who, in most cases, would not be able to do much on his own, become more than what he was meant to be, and rise to the occasion, taking on dragons, goblins, spiders, and many other obstacles, and finally returning home as an unsung hero to most. Two tiny bags of gold home with you? Your share was greater. It's all my pony could carry, and it's more than I'll ever need. But you have other prizes. The ring? Oh, yes. I'll keep it as a souvenir, in a glass box on the mantel. Ha! <laughs> I really enjoyed the Rankin and Bass version of The Hobbit. It remains to this day one of my fondest cartoons of the 80s. If you'd like to experience Rankin and Bass's version of The Hobbit for yourselves. You might want to look on Amazon or eBay, or you might even want to look at your local Walmart or other department stores, as the DVDs were re-released by Warner Brothers Entertainment not too long ago. Well guys, that'll about do it from a look back at Rankin and Bass's version of The Hobbit. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave me a like. It really helps me out. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions on anime, cartoons, toys, or anything else you'd like me to look at, please leave that in the comment section below. And consider sharing this with someone who you think might enjoy it. Well guys, as always, thank you very much for watching. Check out some of the other episodes I've done. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter.